Hello and welcome to Theorycraft, the channel that likes to moan more than a struggling actress in her first porno. <laughs> my name's Ben, over here is my co-host Jack. We are two, ho two dudes that like to rant, rave and ramble all things sci-fi, comic booky, TV series or movies just gone by. And... Yeah, we pretty much just round about them till the end of the stream, pretty much. For this week, it is a discussion about a very rare movie that I don't think a lot of people know about, The Return to Oz. Oh dear. Yeah, I think Jack's <laughs> putting it politely, to be fair. So this cluster fudge of a movie is meant to be a sequel to the original uh, Wizard of Oz, lovable film from the 1940s with Judy Garland. I believe it was the first ever colour movie. Because uh, Yes, I do believe so. I do believe so. But at the time, Judy Garland was 16. She was meant to be playing a character that's meant to be between the ages of 10 and 12. But I, I thought she was older than 16. She looks so much older in that. Yeah, I thought that as well. I would have said at least like 18-ish or further. Yeah, but this sequel took about 40 years to like happen. It was 1985, this sequel. Yeah, and I found out the main actress who plays like the little Dorothy is also in Blade and was one of the main actresses in The Craft. Yes, she was. I was about to bring that up as well, actually. <laughs> but yeah, it's... It explains the reason why her career path went in that direction, to be fair. Which, thank goodness, to be honest. <laughs> yes, but, I mean, this movie is obviously a Disney movie. You have expectation that it's going to be very lovely. It's la 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 da 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 da, -da, -da. PG stuff, all for the kids. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's just, like, for the moment, let's have a look at what they came up with in terms of poster for this movie because I still don't understand how the hell this poster looks so starkly different compared to say the actual movie itself so this is the poster I'm, I'll zoom in a bit for you just to make things a little bit easier so it looks pretty innocent like there's Dorothy on a flying uh, sofa, the, you the got moose the sofa. Yeah. yeah, it's the moose sofa mixed with obviously the cowardly lion. You got the character TikTok, you got the scarecrow, the tin man, and then you got the chicken, the chicken, and then you've also got Jack. I can't remember what he's... he had to, he had a surname, but he was like Jack the scarecrow or something. Yes, but. Oh my god, this movie really wasn't as cheery as that poster made it out to be. <laughs> no, the only way I can describe it is probably diabolically insane. I mean, it is almost as if um, Walt Disney himself went on Schizophrenic Weekend. <laughs> yeah, it was Schizophrenic Weekend with a lot of LSD. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's just when they came up with all these like different villains and characters, just that's the... Oh my! Oh my goodness! Well, the thing is, it I didn't realize it was loosely based off books. There was novels that the original creator made back in the early nineteen hundreds. So, obviously, whenever it's turn of the century stuff, there's always going to be somebody that has like a fever dream imagination of predicting what the next century is going to be. And I just trying to get my head around the certain aspects of the book as well as the movie why they came up with this sort of things within well, it well i think just the main like the main thing like this this doesn't it's not cheery from start to finish because you have i think it was wasn't it dorothy who is like outrightly stating that all these things that happened in the land of oz really happened and i think like her, it was her mother who commits her to an asylum at the age of 10 no, it's her aunt and uncle, because they never explain, unless it's said in the book, why she lives with her aunt and uncle. 
But essentially, it's not long after the, the Wizard of Oz in terms of the timeline of it, where she's returned from Oz, she's not sleeping because she keeps having recurring dreams of Oz, so she's staying up at night. And because of that, instead of doing the healthy thing, like talking with your grown-ups and trying to find the right answers, they go to this quack doctor who is apparently using the magic of electricity to <laughs> heal her. Yeah! Yeah! Like this well, poor yeah, girl. But, yeah, we have to remember it was a very common practice back in the day. I mean, it's funny how it's only about a hundred years ago, hundred and fifty years ago, give or take, that that was in practice, which doesn't sound a long time ago if you think about it. No, but really, it what was it like seventies, eighties ish? Well, the movie itself was nineteen eighty five, but oh Christ in hell. Um, but the fact that you have like this poor ten year old girl get committed to an insane asylum that's not even the tip of the iceberg of this film, folks, but there's this bit here that I find I've just found it quite disturbing where they they explain to the Dorothy that basically it'd be a good idea if she doesn't move about too much so they strap her down to the bed which okay fair enough but uh with it I don't think it's going to let me show you the image well what you if it's not going to let you show what are you trying to uh, describe so like basically you've got this poor 10 year old girl strapped down with like leather restraints which are heavy duty things because that's the point of these beds is to keep a grown man restrained onto a gurney why would you do that for a 10 year old girl like why <laughs> like, what fudgery do you have to have in your own head to think you know this 10 year old girl has got these wild imaginations she might be psychotic enough to try and murder me so i gotta strap her down to a bed no 10 year old can kill you not really. Well, I doubt it. If you watch a lot of Rob Gavigan's uh, channel, there's a video on there of like the 10 most evil killer kids, which I think will change your mind. <laughs> well, yeah, but then, well, I think most of them are American, so that says it all. But <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't really get any better than that, to be fair, folks. So, like, I mean, So there's some point after that where she ends up in, what's it called, the magical desert in Oz, did not she? The Deadly Desert. Deadly Desert. Which they never really covered in the first one, but she somehow knows about it, just pure logic of the plot. But basically, if anybody touches a grain of sand in the deadly desert, they get turned into the sand and get absorbed into the deadly desert. Yeah. So you have her stepping on the stones to try and get to the Emerald City. I don't know why, but somehow her chicken from home is with her, called Helena. Which, which can speak. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's understandable all animals can speak in Oz. Like, it's Oz. Who cares? But where the hell did the chicken come from? I don't, to... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, it just, and it has a very posh, like, English-speaking voice as well, which is quite funny. If anything... Hey, Dorothy, Dorothy. <laughs> if anything, it would be... Is, I'm surprised they never thought about casting Betty White to be the voice of the chicken because it just seems the ultimate role for her. I don't know why. Yeah. But it just it gets worse by each scene. Like you get to the point where you got these nightmare fuel baddies. Like there's three types of baddies. You got the minions, you got the the second class baddie, and then you got the main baddie. But the second class villains are by far a nightmare fair of fuel in on pond I mean, themselves. I mean, the Wheeler gang. Yes, the Wheelers. Oh my god, like because like when I was first watching it, like the mat, like that's not actually the face. That's no. a mask. But then yeah. they're all like a helmet mask sort of thing. But that is freaky as hell. <laughs> the, th the first thing that came to my head is if the Joker decided to go back to the 70s and got obsessed by the roller skating ray, like, rave. Yeah, because like, they have, like, they have um, like, wheels on their hands as well as their feet. Yeah, it's, such a, it's such a weird concept. But the thing is, 
Like, you can tell when you're watching it back that they're struggling so hard to keep up right half the time. They just keep falling over. They can't be bothered to edit it out. So they just make it like it's, oh, it's just they just toppled over something randomly. Well, see, the point is, like, it's not, like, so much about, you don't even care if it's, like, not the best film or that is just, <laughs> like, because it's, it's not a very good film. To be honest, it's not a good film. But then God. you don't personally care because you're just watching it going, what the hell is this? <laughs> That, that's the thing, that the entirety of this movie is just, what the hell happened to Wizard of Oz? <laughs> like, the Wizard of Oz is such a lovely movie where you go, we're off to see the wizard, the, wizard. the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Don't, but, don't sing the rest of that song because of copyright. <laughs> who cares? <laughs> but it's like there is no musical element in this entire film. Everything has gone to ruins. There is no happiness until the, the last part of the movie. I mean, it's like, at the beginning of the movie, you have, like, the uncle to Dorothy. Yeah. He apparently broke his leg, so that's why he's not been working much. And then Dorothy just says, oh, why does an uncle help us out, Auntie M? And she goes, oh, no, she says, uh, well, Dorothy says along the lines that, oh, he's still got a dodgy leg. He goes, no, Dorothy, he's faking it. He's lazy. But the thing is, right... Looking back at it as like in the 21st century where we discuss the idea of mental health, you can see the way he's characterised is like he's depressed or he's stressed out or something. Like the way he's slumped, the way he doesn't talk much, the way he doesn't really interact with a lot of people where he's isolated from everyone else. Obviously, it's a mental health thing. That's why he's not working. But given the time in which it's set, they just fob it off as laziness. And it's weird to think how like the weird parallels like from today yeah but it's just like the guy doesn't even do much in the movie i think the last five minutes of the movie he has like two lines and that's it yeah well i just think like obviously for everybody watching this in the future the topic of like dorothy's mental state is going to come up later on in the video but we're just gonna get get keep rolling through everything so yeah Obviously, so obviously you've got like the wheelers which chase her into I can't remember where they chase her into like where she gets locked inside the wall um, it's in the Emerald City yeah which I think is like isn't it the emeralds which are like all the emeralds that are in the uh, that are in Oz are owned by the Gnome King who is the main baddie yeah so basically the Gnome King has decided to steal all of the emeralds from Emerald City because he believes it's his rightful property yes which I can kind of understand, given the like the fact that he is a rocky character, like he's like meant to be like made out of rocks. It makes sense that it's part of the earth. It might be it's some sort of eco warrior type thing, I suppose. But uh, maybe, but I w I was convinced you were just going to go in for a pun just then. I was like, oh no, he actually is a rocky character. <laughs> Well, I mean, they're all unstable regardless. I mean, I don't think there's a single character in the entire thing that has any stability. <laughs> well, no, but there was a um, another channel I was watching who was doing like a retro review on this film. And because it, like there was a lot of stuff to do with like a lot of mental health, but obviously you've got to understand people that mental health was very different back in the 80s. It's not like it is today whatsoever. And I think there was like what this YouTube channel, I cannot remember its name for the life of me, but she was talk doing a retro review and talking about the fact that Dorothy was in like some kind of asylum, you had electric shock therapy and everything, and then eventually journeys back to um, Oz, that all the different sort of um, villains, baddies, or maybe like the good characters, like the chicken or Dorothy herself, uh, the mummy, Princess Mummy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like all these different characters represent some kind of mental illness like you have like the princess mummy like all the different heads and everything could that be representative of multiple personalities you know all that kind of stuff there's a lot of if you really look at it from a mental health perspective you can kind of pick these things out yeah i mean i suppose to a degree wizard of oz does have that because when you look back obviously you've got the cowardly lion so it's like dealing with like social anxiety you got, say, the Tin Man that's Depressed. just... <laughs> yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of things within The Wizard of Oz that you look back on it and it does to a degree have some sort of imagery of mental health stuff. 
but the movie Return to Oz just is such a fever dream. I mean, like, let's have a look. What's the next thing I was going to cover? Yeah, so let's have a look at Princess Mumby's Room of Heads. Like, it, considering the fact that they didn't have a lot of CGI back then, this was really well done. Oh, yeah, I will say, this was actually quite good. <laughs> like, obviously, it'd be each actress was standing in the blackened room, they wear black and just, like, have their head, like, connected to what looked like the head plate. I mean, the good thing with this is, as well, is, like, normally when you have someone that's beheaded, you can tell that there's, like, an extra bit of room, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like when I used when I watched um, Sleepy Hollow, it was so bad watching the headless horseman because there's such a big gap between knowing where the head should be and then when where the head actually goes. But with this, it still looks relatively normal height for the person to be. There isn't much difference. No, because I was wondering if maybe like the head, like maybe like the head was just in its usual place, and maybe they built the shoulders up a bit higher so that the shoulders are they like built up the shoulders so it's above the head. Maybe I'm not sure, but it's very good how they achieved this illusion because I'm not sure. I'm not because I wasn't sure if like they were using. I don't think they were using like green screen or anything back then, were they? Well, I mean, green screen was relatively new back then. Like everything was still in uh, beta. Um, yeah, pretty much like this is like th this is well before like the days of Toy Story and all that, which were like well, when we spoke about Toy Story and Tron, which were so in innovative for their time. But this was like after Return mm. to Oz. It's, I think the way they must have done it was, like you say, a combination of making the shoulders higher. But I think they might have done it so they angled the character in such a way that she could lit like tilt her head down, so like the portion wasn't too high up well yeah because when you see that photo that you just showed if she's even just like left forward with her head you wouldn't be able to tell because of the angle that she's at no but <sighs> her character it didn't really explain much in terms of why she was a baddie she was like second in command she screwed up com potentially like within five minutes of letting dorothy go <laughs> yeah and then you get the main baddie, the Gnome King, which he has the most bizarre motives of being a bad guy. So this is him in like the most realistic version of being a human cross rock version of himself. Yeah. And the whole thing is, for some reason, he stole the red ruby the. Uh, Ruby slippers from Dorothy when she left Oz in the first place, hence why she didn't come with her when she went back to Kansas. But he basically wears them because he wants to become human. But the thing is, this is the biggest plot hole within the movie, okay? So he transforms all the different people within Oz into green things. The more green things they are, the more human like he becomes. Because he has, when there's like the scene where Dorothy, the new characters, and some of the original ones are with her, bit by bit, as they guess wrong who is and who isn't in this so called room of random knickknacks, a person, he gets more and more human like. But when she guesses right, he looks less and less human and more and more rock like. But he's wearing the red slippers, so why doesn't he wish to be human? And then he doesn't need to transform people into random green objects. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, that's the thing that I don't get with this movie. Like that, if he's had the red slippers the entire time, why did he need to make things green to look more human? Why did he need to be human in the first place? He doesn't even have to. No, like not to be funny, but if he's capable of like being a rock slash humanoid thing, he doesn't age, he doesn't need to eat, he doesn't need to drink, doesn't need to breathe. If anything, he'd be immortal, he'd be better off as a bad guy as he was than being human. Yeah, I agree. But the thing that I find like the most random ass weakness for a bad guy to have is that he is Allergic to eggs? 
Yeah, it's like for, like to him, like is where like there's a particular scene where like he says like like eggs are poison, you know, <laughs> just which it's the most random thing ever. I mean, this to be fair, I suppose it was ahead of its time, considering you got people these days that are lactose intolerant, gluten intolerant, God knows whatever intolerant. Maybe it was just yolk intolerant. People intolerant. <laughs> no, that's just be that's just normal. <laughs> But it's just like I just trying to wrap my head around like how does like <coughs> swallowing an egg kill the bad guy? Like, <laughs> well, that's like, the point. I don't know why I'm trying to make sense of it because it doesn't have to make sense in the first place. I don't no, know why I'm trying to make sense of it. No, I know, but I mean, at least with some of it, there was a bit of logic. Say, there was the powder of life where. That's how you got Jack Skellington, or whatever the fudge's name was, to become alive. Like he was doused in the, chem- the the powder, and that's how he became alive. And then Dorothy used it to make that horrible makeshift thing. That that had some like logistics to it. But how does a rock guy have such intolerance to eggs that he crumbles? Literally, he crumbles apart. I have no words, to be honest. I got no words. I got nothing. I mean, it's just like... It was a really cool movie, don't get me wrong. It was a really interesting way that they did this guy because it was a mixture between stop motion and then being the actual actor because it's like the less rock-like he was, the more human he was. But when he was back to the rocky form, they had to do things like stop motion. But I just... My head just not compute in terms of why like what reason would something that is a sentient rock want to be human i don't get it i mean the thing is as well i've i've never read the books but i got a feeling they may have tweaked a few things for it because it may have been trying to mimic the never-ending story if you remember that 80s movie yeah so you obviously have a random person from normal world that is the protagonist and is basically combating against the bad guy. And then there is the innocent princess, powerful princess character that's locked away from everyone who ends up being the, like, the saviour towards the end of the movie. Same goes for this one. Mm-hmm. So I think that whether or not it's the same... It actually happens in the books. I don't know, but I think they tried to mimic that ideal within the movie itself. But it just doesn't like translate very well. Like it's all over the place. This movie, it just doesn't know what it's trying to do, other than be on LSD. I am pretty much convinced that the producers and the director, whilst filming this entire thing, were definitely on some sort of illicit <laughs> substance. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it's like. When she returns back to Kansas, she's just found randomly by a riverbank because the last thing she had in Kansas was that she was going down the river and then she suddenly woke up in Oz. And then she gets found by the riverbank and then her uncle finds her, has his, like, two lines, goes, oh, my God, I found you, I missed you. So it's like, yeah, but you done fuck all for months, <laughs> you lazy <laughs> bastard, and now you're crying with happiness even though you've committed your only niece to an insane asylum to be electrocuted because she had imagination that was a bit too wild. Yeah. <laughs> In essence, yeah. I mean, it's just like... The end of the movie is all lovely where you get like the evil psychiatrist nurse gets taken away by the police and Dorothy doesn't get committed. She goes back to her auntie Erin and her uncles. The uncle finishes the house Everything's lovely. The farm's all back together, la di la di. Right, but like, <laughs> I would, I would honestly, I would argue, I would have the argument because this is such, for me, this is such a completely different Oz. And for when Dorothy, of my, I think like the first beginning of the film, I believe, is completely real and happening within the context of the film, what she's seeing, feeling, and so on. Mm-hmm. But when she goes into the insane asylum, like gets the shock therapy and everything, for me, everything after that is all in her head. Because I started to think, is Dorothy genuinely nuts? 
Is she insane and this is just all within her mind? I think, to be fair, it would make a lot of sense. I, because I, I, don't, I don't think she's in Oz whatsoever, to be honest. No, because the funny thing is, is that the Princess Mumby is the same actress that plays the nurse, that's the psychiatric nurse, and the doctor that does the electroshock therapy is the same guy that plays the Gnome King. This, it, it's in her head. I, there is no other convincing me. It's in her head. I mean, I don't think, think this kid's nuts. The thing that I find so funny is the fact that I don't know why it's like a stereotypical thing that all psychiatrists look like Fr uh, Saint Frank Freud or whatever. They have a big bushy beard and they like to smoke pipes. And it's like there's a bit with the Gnome King where he looks a bit more human and he starts smoking a rock pipe. I know. But it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Like, if, he, like, if he's made out of rocks and so is the pipe, is he literally smoking himself? Well, we would be in a sense, wouldn't we? But, like... <sighs> Again, like, for me, like, everything, like, all the parallels, like, the same, like, people play in, like, this, ima in her imagination, which I am saying it's her imagination. It's not Oz at all. And there was, it's kind of, it was a, contro a bit of a controversial topic in this one video that I saw on a retro review, and... If you think about it in the essence of maybe she is just hallucinating and they did this horrible thing with the shock therapy to a 10-year-old girl, it, for me, there's no doubt she is in an asylum and she's probably imagining all this in her head, but whereas a matter of fact, she's probably sat in a room talking to a white wall. <laughs> yeah, but then you could also argue the fact that maybe she had the electroshock therapy... Uh, she imagines the girl that takes her out of the thing. She gets down the river. So it's in her delusion. So she's like, she's got a psychotic split now because the electrotherapy did something to her. That's why she's found on the riverbank because it could have been, that's the last bit of energy she had left and then imagined everything afterwards to be Oz and then wakes up. It could have been like a day where she was unconscious. Yeah. And yet the time frame of being in Oz is like two, three days. It, like, it's so weird, the way, the way the whole movie ends. I just... I, I don't understand how everything is so happy and go lucky at the end of it all when it seemed like the farm was falling apart, the only chicken they had wasn't laying eggs... Then suddenly they had loads of chickens laying eggs and the farm's all happy and Larry and nobody's going to go anywhere. So whether... Maybe she didn't even wake up at all. What if she died? And what if... What if she... Not all oh, now I'm thinking. What if she died and the happy ending might be her version of heaven? Yes. Oh my God! Yeah, so it could be like the journey between... This got twisted very quickly. Well, that's what we do best here. So you could have the idea that Oz is her journey to the happy ending. So everything she used to know that was happy in Oz is obviously broken and shattered like it is at home because the Yellow Brick Road is completely broken. The Emerald City is completely broken, just like her home because of the tornado. Yes. So then obviously she has to journey further into Oz to try and find her friends that was her happiness... She finds new friends, which causes happiness. She fights the baddie. She's in a happy mood. And then she gets to the point where she's fully happy. And they send her home, which is completely fine. But what if that's her paradise? Like, that's the ultimate paradise, that her home is all put together again. It's just manifested within the mind. Yes. I've... 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 Like, so I know, like, so when we've done these videos, over time, when, like, you guys have been watching and so on, if you've been following with us, whenever, like, we ask, like, e like ask each other to review, like, really weird, twisted films, and, like, the conversations back and forth, if you could see, like, our, like, messages back and forth when we're talking about these things, it's a gold mine of, like, our thoughts and everything. I think if we were to make, like, a book out of that, Oh my goodness, those conversations would be worth gold. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, we've been doing this for, what, about a year or so now? No, more than that. No, it doesn't seem that long. 
but we was we were slowly struggling to find content, and then all of a sudden we just found weirder and weirder things. We yeah, we kind of went, went down a bit of a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, and we haven't really dug ourselves out yet. No, but. I don't know what else to add to this movie, really. I mean, the thing that I find the most bizarre thing of all is like the weird Jack Skellington or whatever the fudge his name is. He has mummy issues. Like, if that's not the 21st century, I don't know what is. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> it's like the first female character he comes across, he goes, are you my mum? It's like... <laughs> She's a 10-year-old girl. What do you fucking think? <laughs> and she, she goes, no, I'm not. He goes, well, can I call you, Mum? She goes, sure. It's like, oh, she's 10 in, years old. In the context, that's really creepy. <laughs> it's just like, for God's sake. It's just... <laughs> that starts off a whole round of questions I don't want the answers to. <laughs> no, no. I think that's like the deep, dark web that we really need to stay away from yeah i don't really want i those are questions i'd rather not have answered <laughs> but i think all in all it's a good movie for something that's fantasy based something that sort of explores a bit more something of a classic like movie the wizard of oz but it's not essential if you're not all that fussed by it exactly but yeah i think that's pretty much it for this week's episode Next week is Jack's turn, and what cluster fudge of a topic are we going over for next week? Oh, I'm going to have a proper moan next week, because we're going to be talking about something which is coming up a lot at the moment, especially due to a lot of controversy with, like, even cartoon skunks, which is completely stupid. <laughs> but we're going to be talking about good old cancel culture. And the fact that this generation is filled with nothing but snowflakes. <laughs> uh, I think I said to you earlier on, this generation is more useless than a paper towel on the Titanic. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, uh, like the one subject which we will be talking about, but I'm going to leave you guys with a question. If, like, Pepe Le Pew, the skunk, was a problem, for all this time, for all these decades, it was always a problem because of like the girl, the girl skunk that he fancied and everything like that. Why was it not a problem for all these decades, but it's a problem now? Yeah, that's, good question. Just, just that's food for thought. Think about it. Definitely, I'm sure there's probably. I tell you what, if anyone's watching this and they can think of any other so-called issues with like Pe Pepe Le Pew or other characters similar, say like Quagmire for Family Guy, drop them down in the comments below. We'd love to hear your thoughts and try and figure out what you think is a bit too OTT for today's media. But there we go. That is next week's topic, cancel culture and the absolute lunacy that it is. Thanks for joining us. We've been ranting about half an hour about a very bizarre movie that is Return to Oz. And again, stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you all soon. Laters. <laughs>